chat box. At this time, I would like to turn today's program over to Canada Health InfoWay. The floor is yours. Thank you. So my name is Louise Beauchene. I'm the uh, Executive Regional Director for Quebec here at uh, Canada Health and Foway. And I'm very pleased today to introduce uh, Guy Paris and Marie-Claude Trudel to present uh, the telepathology report that they worked on. So Guy is a Professor of Information Technologies at the HEC here in Montreal. And um, he's also the Chair of the Canada Research in Information Technology in Healthcare. He's been uh, publishing and being very active here in Quebec and uh, as well have been um, sought by numerous organizations like the World Health Organization, the Department of Health in France, of course the Ministry of Health here in Quebec and Canada Health and Poway. He was elected member of the Royal Society of Canada in 2012. Marie-Claude Trudel is an assistant professor of information technologies at, at, at HEC in Montreal and I'm very pleased to introduce uh, them to, the, um, to this uh, conference. I would ask you to, uh, if you have any questions, you can ask them throughout the presentation. I will facilitate these questions at the end of the, uh, the formal presentation of Guy and Marie-Claude. And for all our people here in Quebec, uh, please feel free to ask questions in French if you'd rather do it, and I'll uh, gladly um, translate at the, uh, your questions. Um, in about a week from now, you will receive an email from Canada Health and Foway uh, with the link to the presentations and as well with the uh, audio recording. As well, there will be a survey and we'll kindly ask you to uh, fill the survey so we know how to improve next time. So without further ado, Guy and Marie-Claude, it's your turn. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Louise. Um, so before we start, uh, we thought that since we're not using uh, cameras and videos, uh, we would present uh, ourselves through pictures, so you can see Mary Claude and I. Uh, and we would also uh, like to acknowledge the contribution of two people uh, in, for this study. The first one is Dr. Bernard Tetu, who acted as a clinical champion on this project, and Dr. Tetu provided us with uh, numerous insights. Uh, insightful comments and suggestions throughout the study. So thank you very much, Dr. Tetsu. And uh, we're also indebted to uh, Julien Meyer, one of my doctoral students here at HEC, who was actively involved in the data collection and data analysis phases of the study. So uh, unfortunately, Julien couldn't be with us uh, this afternoon. Um, in terms of uh, how we structured the presentation, um, first I will present the objectives, the background, and the methodology that we uh, followed. And then Marie-Claude will share with you uh, the main findings of our study along with the few lessons learned. Our pre presentation should last about uh, 30, 40 minutes, so we, we should have plenty of time for uh, comments and questions at the end. So the main objectives of this uh, webinar are the following. First, we're going to be introducing the key characteristics uh, of the telepathology project that was initiated within the RUIS Laval. I will explain in a few seconds what a RUIS is. Uh, then we will present the methodology that was adopted in this evaluative study. We will highlight the varied forms of usage and impacts of telepathology within the RISC project. And finally, we will share the key lessons learned from this large project that may assist other implementation of telepathology throughout the country. So now I will explain to you what uh, RIS are. So the province of Quebec counts four integrated university health networks that we call RIS in French. These have been set up uh, by the Ministry of Health to ensure the delivery of specialized and highly specialized care services in all regions of Quebec. Each RUIS is asso associated with a faculty of medicine. We count four faculty of medicine in Quebec at Laval University, University of Montreal, McGill University, and Sherbrooke University. The main mandate of each RUIS is to ensure the provision and organization of specialized services to enhance their effectiveness, to avoid duplications, 
and to prevent breaks in services. So having said that, I will now present some of the some background information related to the uh, telepathology project in uh, Ruiz Laval. As in most provinces in, Cuba, in Canada, there is a, an acute shortage of pathologists in Quebec. In fact, according to the Quebec Association of Pathologists, the province has approximately 180 pathologists, while near 300 would be needed to meet the demand for these services. While the shortage affects all of Quebec, it is even more severe and or acute in its eastern regions, as we will see later. In the mid-2000s, the Ministry uh, of Health in Quebec asked each RUIS to establish its own priorities in terms of telehealth and telemedicine. The RUIS Laval has decided to focus its, uh, its efforts on telepathology. So uh, the RUIS Laval initiated a telepathology project in 2006 with a budget of $6.2 million. Uh, while the spectrum of applications of digital pathology is wide, the, this project focuses on intraoperative exams, also called frozen section diagnosis, and to a lesser extent on second opinion consults. The main objectives that were pursued in this project were the following. First, to provide intraoperative examination everywhere and at all times on the territory. Second, to achieve gains in terms of the speed and quality of services provided to surgical clients in remote areas. And finally, to facilitate recruitment and retention of surgeons in remote regions and reduce pathologist professional isolation. In terms of uh, characteristics of the project, we must uh, mentioned that Ruiz Laval covers a very broad service area with a population of 1.7 million residents. This is a very low population density uh, region except for the Quebec City uh, region. Ruiz Laval counts uh, 80, 88 pathologists and 30 surgeons in 21 organizations across eastern Quebec. Making, making it one of the most ambitious telepathology projects in North America and, as a matter of fact, in the world. 33 out of the 48 pathologists practice in an academic setting, namely CHUC in Quebec City. That represents nearly 7 out of 10 pathologists on the territory. Uh, another key element is that there is no single responding site to which community hospitals can turn to for pathology services. In fact, the, three, uh, the 33 pathologists at Shuk do not have mandates to provide pathology services across the entire territory. Each requesting hospital is responsible for identifying one or several partners within with which it can find service agreements. So now the, the, the specific objectives of our study were uh, first to understand how telepathology was being used and by whom within the Ruiz Laval, and second to evaluate the nature and scope of the impacts or benefits associated with telepathology usage. In terms of research methodology, we decided to conduct a multiple case study using a mixed method approach, combining both qualitative and quantitative data. Precisely, our research entailed three case studies, which are representative of the different contexts in which telepathology is used within the Ruiz Laval. We collected data mainly through semi-structured interviews with pathologists, surgeons, technologists, and various uh, managers in the OR, labs, and health agencies. These interviews were conducted in the course of seven field visits, and uh, all interviews were recorded and transcribed verbatim, verbatim sorry, producing over 1,100 pages of transcripts. 
All transcripts were then coded using a grid of success indicators for, tele uh, for telepathology projects that was developed by a pan-Canadian committee of experts that was sponsored by InfoWay in 2010 and 2011. We were also able to do some on-site observations. For instance, we were able to attend an unplanned uh, 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 intraoperative exam uh, that, was, that happened in uh, Setil. Uh, and finally, we also collected pre-post quantitative data uh, on the use and impacts of telepathology. I will now present uh, to you a few facts and key elements of each case so you can better appreciate the findings of our study. So the first case involved a requesting site, the Setzil Hospital, and a responding site, the Bekomo Hospital. Both are located in the Cote Nord region, as you can see on this figure. In case one, uh, the project started in a real sense in December 2010 when the pathologist at Setzil Hospital announced that he would be leaving four months later on April 2011. Acting, uh, acting on his own initiative, he convinced the pathologist at the Bekomo Hospital to provide pathology services to Setzil using telepathology. Before he left, the pathologist at uh, Setzil took the time to train one of the technologists in how to handle large specimens and complex cases. For his part, the pathologist at the consulting site left the Bekomo, set, the Bekomo Hospital on June 22, 2012. So our analysis for this first case covers the period when the service agreement between the two facilities was in force, that is between April 2011 uh, and June 2012. Our second case involved three hospitals, two requesting sites, Gaspé and Maria, both located in the Gaspé Z region, and one responding site, Rimouski Hospital, located in the Bas Saint Laurent region. At the time of our study, the Rimouski Hospital had four, not three, pathologists, as indicated in this figure. Since the responding pathologist in case one had left the Bekomo Hospital to join the Rimouski Hospital in June 2012, as I mentioned earlier. So this case involves two requesting sites in the Gaspé Z region. The first one, the Gaspé Hospital, lost its only pathologist in early 2012. It must also be mentioned that it has an ORL surgeon who is very enthusiastic about telepathology. And finally, two technologists were trained in how to prepare and digitize virtual slides. For its part, the Maria Hospital had traditionally operated without a pathologist on site. All specimens were then sent by mail to the Rimouski Hospital, who was the partner. So a new lab had to be created the lab was uh, created in a room next to the OR that was freed, a room that was freed up by surgeon. That shows their strong interest in the tel telepathology project. Finally, we must add that one technologist had over 15 years of experience in pathology. Uh, the consulting site, the Rimouski Hospital, is a large healthcare organization. It recruited two pathologists in the summer 2012, going from two to four. It has a pathologist specialized in ORL. And as in case one, large distances separate the, the, the requesting and the responding sites. Our analysis covers uh, different periods. In fact, uh, we started analyzing data uh, when the, the system was first uh, deployed in each uh, Finally, uh, the third case involved two hospitals, one requesting site, the Tedford Mines Hospital, and one responding site, St. George's. Contrary to the previous two cases, 
both sites are located in a high population density area close to large urban centers. At the time of our study, the pathologist who had left the Setsil Hospital in case one had joined the responding site in case three, namely St. George's. So as you can see, there's lots of uh, movement on the part of pathologists in eastern Quebec. So the Tetford Mines Hospital had always had access to the services of a visiting pathologist one day a week. The visit of this pathologist was deeply rooted in the work habits of this hospital. And three technologists had received training in telepathology at the time of this study. In January 2012, the visiting pathologist stopped serving the Tedford Mines Hospital. So between January and September 2012, a pathologist at the St. George Hospital traveled there occasionally um, to provide intraoperative exams. So the limited availability of this pathologist led the Tedford Mines Hospital to try telepathology several times. These trials uh, were conducted with two institutions affiliated with the CHUC in Quebec City, and those trials proved inconclusive, as Marie-Claude will explain later. In September 2012, a new agreement was signed with St. George Hospital, which had at the time 2.5 pathologists. Slides would be mailed to St. George and intraoperative exams would be performed once a week in the physical presence of a visiting pathologist. So our analysis for this case covers the period from January 2012 to May 2013, which represents the end of our data collection phase. So Mary Claude will now present the main findings and, uh, of our study, along with a few lessons learned. So we will now guide you to our findings, which we divided in three sections. Let's start, uh, let's start with the perceived system quality image, system quality, image quality, and service quality. In both case one and two, some technical problems occurred during the initial phase, but they were quickly fixed. These problems had no major consequences in either facility, and afterwards the system was deemed reliable. However, some technicians in case two believed the system was too slow and it had an impact on the workflow of the laboratory staff. Case three had a whole different story as their very first tries were plagued with several service interruptions and technical incidents. Combined with the fact that uh, the surgeon who was trying the technology was a prominent figure considered as an opinion leader at the hospital, damage was done until pathology acquired a poor reputation for from the very beginning, unfortunately. As for image quality, all the pathologists were pleased with the quality for routine cases, which concurs with scientific studies on diagnosis accuracy in general, and Dr. Perron's study, which was conducted in the Ruiz Laval in particular. However, some concerns were voiced for complex and ambiguous cases, but here one could say that a traditional slide would also have limitations since these diagnoses often require that extra correlation or immunochemistry uh, be performed on the specimen. So a new, slide, a new set of slides has to be prepared altogether. Finally, the service quality was considered to be courteous, quick, and effective at all three levels. That means the hospital technical team, the Ruiz Laval Telehealth Service and Coordination Center, as well as the software provider. The second set of findings look at the usage of the technology within the Ruiz Laval. For the requesting sites, as mentioned before, planned intraoperative examinations were performed regularly in case one and on each side of case two, whereas they were not performed in case three because of an inconclusive start. However, unplanned intraoperative exams were performed in all premises if needed. In addition to these anticipated uses, some other types of utilization emerged. Urgent consultations were asked for routine cases in both case one and three. Case one mainly for slides, 
case 3 for macroscopy. Not surprising that such consultations were not asked in case 3 since these technologists did not prepare the slides anymore. They only boxed and sent the specimen to the consulting site. Yet interestingly, these technologists did mention that it would be a plus if they could use the system for emergency cases, but this would require changes in the tasks they perform. As for the consulting sites, all three used the system to get second opinions, some more than others. A new type of usage emerged from Case 3, who was interested in conducting so-called slide sessions. The idea would be to present a case to many participants remotely located and have them diagnose it. Thus, usage would fall somewhere between a second opinion and a training session. Our third set of findings look at the impacts of telepathology in light of the project objectives. The first objective of the project was to provide continuous coverage of intraoperative examinations in healthcare facilities that did not have a pathologist on site so that no service disruption would occur. This was fulfilled in case one, in both sites of case two, but not in case three, where only unplanned intraoperative exams were performed with the technology. The second objective was to reduce delays and increase the quality of client services in peripheral and remote regions. Despite the fact no quantitative data was available on second surgeries and patient transfers, rich qualitative data collected from surgeons make us, make us state that intraoperative exams using telepathology do help in avoiding second surgeries and improving access to care. The third objective was to facilitate recruitment and retention of surgeons in remote regions. In this study, we saw that telepathology played a role in retaining at least one surgeon at the Sitsi Regional Hospital and also led to recruiting at least one surgeon at the Gaspé Regional Hospital. No evidence was found for case 3. The fourth and last objective was to reduce professional isolation of pathologists. Evidence was found to this effect in both case one and three. It was not applicable to case two since there were already four pathologists on the consulting site. The success of a regional telepathology project such as the Ruiz Laval one depends on taking account and surmounting several challenges. So I will now guide you through some lessons we learned in studying this project. First, on a technical level, it is vital that the equipment and the software perform well and are reliable once the system is up and running, and as such, high-quality technical support is a, is a key success factor. Also, project champions should be informed of tryouts, as they could alleviate the negative effects of technical difficulties, which are unfortunately common in these situations. From a human perspective, we must keep in mind that telepathology changes certain work practices and modifies the nature of the tasks and responsibilities of the professionals involved. Human resistance is therefore a major challenge, and change management is crucial, especially expectation management. For instance, technologists who envision telepathology as an opportunity should be dealt with differently than technologists who see it as a threat to their job. Also, the presence of a champion is another key condition for success at both the requesting and, and consulting sites. When there is no local champion, the project one should be involved as much as possible. Finally, the development of a relationship of trust between the various stakeholders is also associated with the success of telepathology, just as in virtual teams. Implementing telepathology also carries many challenges for the healthcare facilities themselves. Partners must be identified, and contractual agreements must be signed with them, which is not as easy as it seems. Processes and clinical practices have to be standardized between partners. We're talking cuts, yes, but mainly coloration and immuno immunochemistry techniques. Sometimes a medical laboratory must be built from nothing, with all the challenges this brings in terms of expenditures and space management. 
Finally, from a legal perspective, it must be recognized that some acts, such as handling large specimens, are at the limit of what technologists are authorized to do, at least in this province. The Professional Order of Laboratory Technologists in Quebec is apparently investiga investigating this matter. It must be remembered that the sites we investigate in this study all organize their services independently of each other. It is the requesting sites themselves who initiated the negotiations with partner institutions. There are many other requesting sites within Ruiz Laval that have had difficulty finding partner institutions, unfortunately, and this has been a major barrier to the development of telepathology within the network until now. At the start of the project, it was expected that pathologists from Shuk would act as a safety net, but it quickly appeared these pathologists could not offer much. Two explanations can be provided here. The first explanation concerns the organization of pathology services within the Ruiz Laval. Service offer in, in pathology sorry, is organized first to serve local patients, then the regions, then ultimately other regions. If we impose on this natural organization a vision where all institutions are interconnected with, tele with telepathology, this is likely to fail simply because there is no fit. For instance, hospitals do not improve their respective performance by helping other hospitals. Then to succeed, such a decentralized vision must be aligned with a supra-regional vision of the service offer in pathology. Also, appropriate performance indicators must be established. The second explanation involves the compensation of pathologists in Quebec, as the current compensation scheme, or at least the one that prevailed during our study, did not incite pathologists to help institutions in need, or it had a very narrow definition of in need. Both of these issues can only be solved by the Quebec health authorities, along with the support of administrators at regional health agencies. Without effective political interventions, all the initi initiatives, enthusiasm, and determination in the world will be unable to ensure the long-term survival of such a major collective project. Thank you. Thank you, um, Guy and Marie-Claude. Um, we have a first question here. Um, could you um, um, give a little bit more detail about the use of the technology in the project? Was it uh, for primary use? So um, there was an impression towards the presentation that you made that it was mo mostly secondary consultation. So could you uh, give us a little more details on that? Well, the focus of the project was, uh, was on intraoperative examinations. So um, this was uh, mainly what was uh, the, why the system was used. But the system was also used for second opinions, not for routine cases, though. The comments we uh, had about uh, using the, the technology for routine cases um, was mainly negative. The system was too slow, and it was un inconceivable as of now to uh, to uh, do uh, all to read all the routine cases with the technology, but that was not the the objective of the project to begin with. Okay, thank you. I have another question um, because I read your report and I listened to you carefully. We can see that there's a lot of barriers to make uh, the technology successful, both in use and uh, surmounting, you know, like the uh, leadership and governance and organizational. So I have a multi <laughs> multi um, multi level question for you guys um, would you consider the, the the so do you see a role for the Canadian pathologist association to to play it in Canada because we can see that the technology is not as mature as I would as I could see we could see that it's maybe diagnostic imaging which is which is largely uh, endorsed by the uh, uh, Canadian Association of radiologists so do you think that the Canadian Pathologist Association can play a role into that? And uh, the other question is more like, um, would you, if you had to recommend something, um, what are the barriers that need to be addressed first, organizational or clinical leadership or 
I'd like to hear you both perspective uh, on this. Let me write that down. <laughs> the role of the association. Hmm. The idea on this piece? Well, uh, certainly the association, like the provincial ones and the uh, Canadian one, can play a role in uh, encouraging a more um, in, in encouraging training in terms of uh, pathology informatics in general. I think uh, there is a need for pathologists to be uh, educated and to better understand how technology can uh, help them do a better job. Uh, there was a recent uh, survey conducted uh, with, uh, that was sponsored by the Canadian Association of Pathologists that was just published uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, that one of the key findings of that study was that uh, there must be more training for um, uh, students uh, in the faculty of medicine. So I think uh, the association, the Canadian Association, should uh, definitely play a role at at that level. I don't know, Matt, do you see anything uh, else? And also to link it to your second, uh, the second half of your question, I think there uh, should uh, always, uh, there could always be a role be played in uh, the organizational uh, barrier, which is one of the most important one uh, that. Uh, According to our report, uh, you cannot organize a uh, service around a technology if the, 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 the pathology service uh, as a whole has not been reorganized. Uh, so I think rethinking the way ser pathology services are provided uh, in the province, and that would uh, also uh, mean that uh, the um, the, the assistive pathologists could be formed because this is something, this is a, uh, a point that we mentioned earlier. We were not able to uh, get confirmation about this, this training of the technologists that would be uh, provided so that they can uh, fully assist pathologists, uh, especially with the large specimen manipulations. And so reorganizing the whole service, pathology service, around maybe new types of uh, um, jobs, and uh, also with a more regional feel. Uh, if they can do that, that would definitely help. But I think uh, they will need the help uh, from the government too. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, regional agencies uh, have to play a role in this uh, reorganization of pathology services and the introduction of pathology of telepathology in general. Um, to answer your uh, second question, uh, Louisa would just add to what Marco uh, mentioned that. Uh, uh, Telepathology as a technology should not be conceived as a black box, you know, and just the fact that you introduce telepathology and you, you deploy equipment and software in healthcare organization, uh, usage and uh, benefits are not going to happen uh, like uh, by magic, you know. So the, the challenges are around the notion of alignment. So the technology needs to be aligned with uh, new processes. Marie-Claude alluded to the fact to that uh, uh, there, there, there is a need for standardization of processes and uh, protocols and, and stuff like that. But uh, so we also have to think in terms of uh, job roles and uh, who needs to be accountable for what. Uh, we also need to think in terms of uh, structures, uh, maybe uh, have a, a more regional approach towards uh, pathology services in general instead of a uh, hospital, uh, like a silo logic. And we have to be clear about uh, the objectives, uh, the reasons why we uh, telepathology is being introduced. So it's a very complex uh, puzzle. Uh, not easy one to solve, but um, I think uh, obviously the uh, uh, healthcare authorities uh, and the agencies need to uh, play a more active role in developing this vision 
because as you uh, you said you saw in the presentation, we spend lots of money on this project, so uh, um, more attention should be devoted to these uh, fundamental and strategic questions. Thank you. Um, I received a question that I know the answer in, and my first reaction was to not ask the question, <laughs> but I will ask it anyway because I think it will it will portray you know the reality of of uh, having champions in in institutions, and and when the champions are gone, uh, unfortunately service is not always covered. So the question was around the Bacomo and Settle uh, experience, which seemed to be a. a very positive. When the uh, pathologist left, uh, was the service co continued after that? Um, well, this is very peculiar in that situation because the, 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 the thing that is that the agreement that was signed at the beginning uh, had to stop when the pathologist left. And unfortunately, the agreement couldn't leave with the pathologist. If it had been, if the the agreement could have uh, lived with the pathologist and the pathologist could have continued providing the, the the service for the requesting sites, that would have been okay. But uh, because again uh, of silos and uh, different administrations uh, trying to uh, they Im uh, implied in these uh, uh, agreements at the. Um, Unfortunately, this pathologist could not uh, continue providing the services, especially for intraoperative examinations, but also for all the other cases. And yeah, now uh, what we saw is that uh, after that, everything had to be started anew. And um, uh, so it talks, it talks they had a lot of sustainability of the of these projects. You know, like uh, surviving uh, yeah. the, the champions on, on the site. Would you say that it's easier to implement telepathology within one administrative region? Uh, would it solve some of these issues if it was only within one region? Or the fact that it's beyond the, these boundaries within, because the risk is, is uh, an organization above these regions, provides more barriers to... to uh, I, I don't see why it would be, it would solve the problem because it would create another one. Uh, these regions, the barriers are artificial. I mean, for, in some of these regions, there are so few cases, or so like that a full-time pathologist could not have a full-time job possibly in some of these hospitals. So to to have them work, like to put them together and to centralize uh, them in some, like in the with the Himuski idea is a good idea. But the thing is, the agreements they have to be uh, have to flow between these uh, bound these boundaries more easily and that's where there has to be changes uh, because at this at this point this is the most difficult part uh, yeah. of it and as case number two showed clearly uh, this case should be considered a success and uh, the requesting uh, sites were in the Gaspésie region while the uh, uh, responding site was in the Bas Saint Laurent uh, region, so uh, th that case in itself shows that it is possible to uh, to succeed, even though uh, hospitals are not located in the same uh, region. Uh, for sure, to go back to your uh, previous question, with uh, clinical championship played a key role in the success of this project so far. But as we uh, clearly uh, mentioned at the end of our report. Uh, if uh, the Ministry of Health and the agencies want this project to uh, pursue and to, to, uh, to be a, a clear success in the end, uh, it will take more than uh, championship uh, in the field. You know. So uh, governance uh, needs to be uh, taken care of now. It, do, what, what's the most per, permanent role that you see telepathology uh, having in Quebec and in Canada for the future? The, the telepathology. Well, hmm. do you see more that um, it'd be more successful to start with second opinion, or do you see? Uh, well, I've, I've read about the other projects. We spoke uh, with the the other uh, people responsible of the projects in in Ontario. Uh, and Ontario. Mm -hmm. These are all different projects. Uh, 
some of them are uh, more about training. I think for, it's a great training tool. Uh, it eases a, a lot of, uh, it makes it more easy for training, for sure. Second opinion, I mean, you have things there that can't really be done with telepathology, and that was mentioned uh, many times. Even with slides, I mean, if you want a second opinion with slides, sometimes, most of the time you'll spend a specimen along with the slides because you'll need for the treatments of the specimen, like coloration or, or immunochemistry, uh, you, you, you will need to do that to, the, to, the spe to a piece of the specimen in order to build new slides, in order to look at those slides, uh, at those new slides. So the same thing applies with telepathology. So you're limited there, of course, but I mean, it, when a second opinion can be provided, could be provided on the same slide, uh, without requiring further examination, uh, further treatments, I mean, I don't see why it shouldn't be uh, provided with a digital slide, and that would speed things up for sure. But again, we're limited here. I think my understanding, because I'm, no, I'm not a clinician, but it's uh, that uh, you cannot have second opinions on, on all sorts of uh, um, disease or, or whatever you find on the slide. So, so yeah. This, but and, and intraoperative examinations. That it's really unfortunate that in case three. The first uh, experiences were uh, did not go well because uh, what we see there is mainly is very very positive, and uh, but it takes uh, very few people that are uninterested to spread the word, and after that it's very it's a lot more difficult to start it again. I think telepathology will experience a similar uh, development as uh, teleradiology. Uh, so in five ten years from now, I think uh, there will be uh, lots of developments that will uh, make uh, complex cases uh, uh, being uh, investigated through telepathology, which is not the case right now. So I think uh, there is a bright future uh, for telepathology and uh, regarding uh, the, 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 the type of usage, uh, I think what uh, uh, agencies and authorities need to think about is what are the needs of uh, certain regions or uh, population. So if uh, intraoperative exams are uh, in great need, you know, in isolated regions like it is in eastern Quebec, then I think this must be set as a priority. So, uh, but uh, our project, along with the ones in uh, BC and Ontario, shows that uh, telepathology can be applied to all sorts of uh, usages, which is a good, uh, a good news. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about compensation? There's a question here uh, that uh, is asking, what did you really mean by compensation? Do you're talking about payments? And, um, and then how do you explain that there's been an increase of 100% remuneration? So I'm not aware of that, but I guess they're saying that they, they, they seem to have knowledge that the pathologists are, are, the remuneration has been increased. Yeah, well, the thing is, this this is this seems to be very complex. I've read it a few times, and uh, what what we, you need to understand is then what is that when we uh, did the study for a, for a couple of months, uh, the the salary were topped for the pathologists. So my understanding is that if they uh, every extra work that they would do uh, over the what they would regularly do for their hospital uh, was not uh, they, they they were not paid for that. Um, after a couple of months, I think I believe it's nine months from January 12, 2011 to September 2011, uh, maybe of a year, <laughs> 2012, no 2011, and um, but uh, what happened is uh, that after that. They changed their regulation, and they allowed pathologists to have extra remuneration. But if they were entering a hospital in need, and that uh, that's why I said that they had a very, uh, a very um, 
their idea of in need was you had to have no pathologist at all to be in to be considered in need. That means that if I were a pathologist in a hospital and I was uh, I wanted to have a vacation because it had been two years since I took my last vacation, well, I couldn't have an, a, another pathologist uh, uh, on call for my hospital because I was not considered a hospital in need. I was there, I was working there, so the, the hospital was covered. So, the, yes, they did change their regulation, but the new regulation was still very uh, Difficult to apply and did not suit all the all the hospitals and all the situations. All the do, types. You, do you think the uh, actual remuneration would be a barrier to to usage? So uh, the the actual remuneration would, will definitely be a barrier to uh, to um, uh, agreements to be signed, for sure, because uh, doctors have no uh, pathologists uh, have no incentive. Uh, Re responding uh, to uh, another hospital, e even if it's just for two weeks of vacation, uh, they don't have incentives, so they, they won't do it. Right. Another question is around the uh, the usage and the statistics that were shown in the three cases. Uh, there there was a, there was I mean we could see that it was a, maybe once a week or there was not a lot of usage. Um, so there was this question about the the uh, pathologists and technologists and all the people that need to perform that, their tasks of re uh, having to relearn all the time. So did you see that? Did you experience that in the in the study? I'm not sure I understood the question, but uh, I just want to clarify something. You know, uh, it might seem to be low usage when you see once a week, but it's not low usage because it's the, the normal flow of uh, activities going on in these hospitals. So the technology was simply used every time there was a need for it. So we should not qualify this as a low usage. Yeah. Uh they, uh, I mean, the, the doctors, the surgeons, they learn more and more that they can use uh, telepathology services to maybe uh, uh, perform uh, different types of surgeries. So uh, what, what you see there as numbers are uh, the, the numbers for the surgeries that used to be done by the surgeons that needed uh, uh, intraoperative examinations while there were, was a pathologist on site. Things didn't change, they continued to be performed, but at one point it started to be performed with telepathology. The, the, the interesting thing is in Maria, Maria, you have, once, you have the same stat there once a week, but you have to remember that before in Maria, there, they they never had a, tel a pathologist, so they were never the surgeons there were never able to perform these types of surgeries mm -hmm. that needed the intraoperative examinations, and they picked it up and so and they started to do it, and uh, from uh, uh, we have uh, citations uh, that say from doctors that say now we're at once a week, but we th we think that it will. Uh, We'll do more and more because now we're learning that we could maybe perform different types of surgeries and uh, use telepathology, and and it's a good thing. So, I think the once a, the once a week is a, is a clearly a good stat. It's not mm -hmm. bad at all. But I, but I guess the question was more towards do you, do you need to retrain from time to time uh, the users? And I guess your answer is that the technology is pretty easy to use. Oh, you mean the use? Uh, but who do you mean as users? Who uh, the users? The technologists, the technologists, you? everybody that touches. Well, the, the technologists, product. if they do it once a once a week, it should it should be okay for mm -hmm. them. Uh, the thing is, and this is a question. I'm not. I'm not very. Uh, I can't really answer this question. But the, 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 we heard the question sometimes that some of these technicians only only uh, work in pathology when they're doing intraoperative examination. So yes, if they do just that, maybe at one point they will need extra training right. just to make sure that they're, uh, they can manipulate correctly all the types of specimen they could, they, that, that could uh, be there in front of them. But uh, this, uh, when the technologists continue to, uh, 
to cut and slice and prepare the slides uh, on site. They, are, they manipulate the specimens uh, regularly, like uh, on a daily basis. So that shouldn't extra training shouldn't necessarily be um, again necessary there. But I'm no clinician. So it's just from what I have been told by uh, people on the field. Okay. Maybe one last question, um, unless there's something that comes up. Uh, could you talk a little bit, uh, as a follow-up research, uh, we, we talked about the uh, quantitative results that uh, we would be looking at to like the wait time reduction, the accessibility of surgeries. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the indicators that you envision that could be made possible in pre-post uh, uh, reading? Yeah, well, that uh, was the main challenges we, uh, we faced during this uh, study having access to uh, complete and detailed uh, statistics uh, in a pre-post logic uh, and all the indicators that can be found in this uh, InfoWay report, technical report that was published in 2011 that is available on your website. Uh, so I think uh, one of the lessons we learned as researcher is that you have to anticipate all the indicators and uh, that you that you want to uh, assess in a pre-post uh, study and to uh, make sure that the data uh, are going to be not only available but reliable and you have clear definitions for each of these definition of each of the uh, indicators that you're going to be using so this is a this is not a, an easy task but uh, and this is not an easy task, especially for the before. We we yeah. that, and I think we were we maybe we were a little bit naive when we entered the field, but we thought that some statistics would just be there, and they just weren't. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, how how long does it take to do an extra an intraoperative examination uh, when there is a pathologist on site? We thought that maybe this would that someone would. Uh, keep track of that, but unfortunately not in in, in all the hospitals where we went. Uh, it was not written down. So we had the after because uh, the government uh, asked for very precise statistics to be kept uh, after the, the telepathology project was implemented, but the, we didn't have any before to compare it to. So, um, and other things like that, the transfers, we say there are transfers patient transfers, but there is no, there is no way to log it. So we, there's, it's very difficult to, to assess how many transfers, how many patients were transferred because they could not be operated uh, in the premise because of a lack of a pathologist on site. So these are things that uh, would be very, uh, very uh, useful, but unfortunately uh, they're hard to, to get. So we've developed a list of uh, key indicators for telepathology projects with uh, the sources where these data can be found. And uh, so if anyone is uh, interested, we, we're uh, willing to share that with the community. Well, thank you. I don't have any more questions, so I'd like to thank you both for this uh, very good presentation, and I'd like to thank everybody who attended. I'd like to remind you as well to please fill the survey when you receive it, and presentations will be available in about a week of time. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you again for joining us today. This concludes today's web conference. You may now disconnect.